Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Teresa Woodruff, and I'm the director of the Women's Health Research Institute here at Northwestern University. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this one year birthday party of the notice uh, to NIH on the inclusion of females in basic research. Uh, today, we're going to consider the sex inclusion uh, policy uh, and um, we, at the end of the day, will come together in a uh, reception out near the posters in the outer area. And it is our intention to have this annual event uh, going forward. And I suspect, again, if we come back in 10 years' time and look back at, at this first year, there will be many more than six posters out in the hallway. And I think this will now seem like one of those topics that was surprising we had to come together uh, to think about. But uh, my goal this morning, or this uh, now, for the next 30 minutes, is to simply give you an overview of what the policy is and where we are now. And so for the purpose of my talk, I've titled Sex Inclusion in Basic Research, Disruptive Technology, uh, Adaptive Behavior, Sound Investment, uh, Better Science, and Better Medicine. And so the notice to uh, the NIH uh, community came out on January 25th, 2016. And as I like to say when I give these talks, that's a date that we should all mark in our calendar because, again, it is a date that I think will influence all of health uh, going forward. It is the notice to NIH-funded investigators that sex must be considered as a variable in scientific research. Now, sometimes I say that this is one of those things that seems so unusual, mostly to the public, who can't imagine that we aren't already considering sex as a biological variable in scientific research. And in fact, even Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, uh, when this was announced last year, uh, said uh, when uh, asked about the policy and wondering why, in fact, we had to have such a policy for NIH-funded investigators. He said, quote, most scientists want to do the most powerful experiment to get the most durable, powerful answers. For most of this, this has not been on the radar screen as an important issue, to which I parenthetically asked, were you not reading our emails? <laughs> and so he said again in this uh, uh, Chicago Tribune interview, what we're trying to do here is raise consciousness. And so um, I think that not only are we trying to raise consciousness, which certainly the notice to the NIH community did do that, it raised the consciousness of the fact that we weren't thinking of this as a, as a biological variable, but I think it did a second thing. It really made us think about the scientific method. And this policy is really not about equalizing males and females. It's not simply about looking at whether or not we can headcount men and women in clinical studies, or whether we can say that in a particular disease that's more prevalent in one sex versus the other, that we're adequately addressing it at the cellular, animal, and clinical level. It's really not about that. It really fundamentally comes down to the scientific method. So this notice is ensuring that normal science is predicated on the scientific method. And if we all think back to uh, when we first started out in science or medicine, there was a pivotal book in 1620, and I actually have it on my desk. I meant to bring it across so I could hold it up uh, for all of us. And it was Sir Francis Bacon's Novum Organum. And the Novum Organum was a piece that had uh, great vitriol published about it when it was first published because it basically challenged the Aristotelian view of how we, do, of how we uh, do science, which is basically just to say that if we see it, it therefore must be true. But Bacon said that instead of just assertion about what must be true, we must devise a method by which we would all agree something that we learn could be validated by all of us as true. And therefore, he came up with the five principles of the scientific method. These include repeatability, economy, measurability on a universal scale, that the, uh, that the uh, uh, experiment is heuristic, and that there is in the end consilience. So repeatability is really what is part of this notice, that we need to improve our rigor, reproducibility, and include all the variables that allow others to have the reprodu reproducibility and rigor that we expect of, out of our science. So really this notice fits squarely within what Francis Bacon said represents the ordinary, normal scientific method. 
Economy means that um, most experiments shouldn't have a million variables, that we really should be testing singular or at most two variables at a time. Because in the absence of that ability to isolate variables in our analytical studies, we have a hard time coming to truth. Measurability on a universal scale says that if I learn something in my laboratory, someone over at UIC or someone in California should also be able to learn the same thing if they follow my scientific method. And that means the way we publish our results need to include all the variables so someone could in fact publish, uh, could in fact repeat what we do. Heuristic means that as we come through a series of experiments, it opens a new window to the next vista. That by learning something, we can in fact infer something about the next step. In our parlance today, we think of that as translational science. That what I learn at the bench level can in fact be utilized in human, uh, in human medicine. And that's where some of what we're doing is actually broken because we don't use sex as a biological variable. And then finally, consilience. Consilience says is all of us begin to learn something about the brain or the liver or about the gut or the muscle or about the reproductive system. All of this can come together in an understanding about the health of that individual or the entrance into disease or the therapeutic that leads us back to health or why those don't go correctly sometimes. So that represents the fundamental, uh, um, the fundamental of the scientific method that I would say all of us must agree on. And in fact, sex as a biological variable is fundamental to each of those parts of our ordinary scientific method. So how do we know that something is true? We have a hypothesis statement. We have stated variables and we test and test again. Galileo's provando, iri provando. We test and test again. So what we'll be talking about today is fundamentally something that we should have been doing for some time, but in fact, we're celebrating the fact that we now are doing it. And as we look forward, we hope to have more and more outcomes that are more um, repeatable, that have more economy, that are measurable on a universal scale, that are themselves heuristic, and in the end, bring consilience around many of the topics that we all uh, share uh, as uh, interest areas. So why should we consider sex as a variable in NIH-funded research? Because it's a part of the ordinary scientific method. So sex, the strain of the animal, the age of the animal, weight, time of day, health condition, the dose of a drug, all of these things are variables that should be part of what we consider as we develop our scientific uh, uh, work. So because Sir Francis Bacon tells us to, and because I fundamentally think we must, we need a hypothesis statement for how we're going to think about our work today. So let me propose this hypothesis statement. At the end, we'll see if Larry Cahill comes up with a thesis out of our hypothesis. Um, but the hypothesis is that the next generation of biomedical advances that improve the lives of all people will require fundamental discovery research that includes sex as a, as a variable. So that's our hypothesis for today's deliberation as we go through this particular workshop. And in my title, I said that sex inclusion in basic research is somewhat of a disruptive technology. It's really remarkable to say that that's the case, and I'll try and build in a few slides the case for this. But in fact, it is something that we hadn't thought about before. So in fact, it creates a wedge sometime with people thinking that maybe this isn't something we should do, or why should we do it, or why should we be forced to do it? So it really is today, one year after that notice, still something that people are talking about. It's a disruptive technology. But I think over time, there's adaptive behavior. So certainly uh, two years ago, and as we were leading up to this initiative, and then in the last year, I've heard more and more people who are discovering things that they couldn't have if they hadn't thought about using a female when they were used to using males. Or as my friend uh, here who was studying MS, who studied all females, a graduate student accidentally pulled a male and now she has a phenomenal discovery of a signaling pathway. So the adaptive behavior sometimes comes by simply becoming aware of the issue. Sometimes it's because of a conversion event because you discovered something that you couldn't otherwise. And I think if we had an entirely new area of science opened up to us, it would be that area of discovery that we would ultimately want to head toward. So that's why I think it's also a sound investment. 
It represents new discovery, new territory that no one has really been in before. And so this represents the opportunity for every student who's attending this workshop to think about as part of what you'll create for your, uh, for your uh, next step in your career. And in the end, I would fundamentally say it represents better science and better medicine because of the scientific method and the ability of the good, rigorous scientific method to be translated more rapidly and more cleanly to clinical, to clinical medicine. So gap analysis, what is the basis of sex? Part of what has been part of the debate is really what do we mean by sex as a variable? Well, sex is the genes, the X and the Y, and every cell has a sex. It has an X and it has a Y or it has two Xs. It's also the hormones, the imposition of hormones on, bio on the biology of individuals, of uh, the reproductive cycles, uh, of cortisol, of uh, the stress hormones. Uh, the hormones of the body uh, pr are produced at different levels and at different times across the life course for males and females. It is also, as we've learned, the microbiome. The microbiome itself has sex, and that's something that we hadn't considered uh, before, and that influences the biology uh, of sex as a variable. And then fundamental anatomy, so different size, different shapes of uh, organs um, between males and females. So the basis of sex really represents uh, these different components and something that we should all be thinking about as we do our work. It is also the case that sometimes we conflate the word sex and gender. And part of that, quite frankly, is because we're sometimes, as the public at large, afraid of using the word sex. Because sex to us sounds like we're going to study people having sex. And it's not that we're studying people having sex, it is that we're studying sex as a fundamental property of our biology. And we have to be able to use the term sex and we have to be able to use the term gender in a way that the public can understand. So sex is the physical and biological characteristics that identify a person as male or female, and gender is a social construct that is associated with behavior or roles or expectations or values we place uh, in being male or female. The chromosomal sex of an individual plays pivotal roles in the biology of sex, but gender also plays out in many ways, both in the laboratory and in uh, disease. And this is associated with different risk profiles, with the severity of the disease, maybe the presentation of a symptom where someone might uh, complain of a symptom more rapidly or more urgently than, uh, than another. It may be in how a technician handles an animal. A male technician and a female technician may handle animals in different ways, and that may influence the outcome of that biology. So sex and gender both can play roles in, uh, in our biology, but at the basic science level, what we really are talking about in this notice is to talk about the influence of sex on outcomes. So we've been working on this for some time. I think some of us in the room for um, probably two decades or so to try and basically raise the awareness of this issue. And uh, I'm only going to share with you the most recent data. Stacy Geller, our friend at UIC, uh, who's unable to be with us today, has the most recent data looking at NIH-funded randomized clinical trials. And uh, they are not uh, changing in any substantive way. There are now um, the Office of Research and Women's Health report equal numbers of males and females. And Melina Kibbe and I looked at uh, surgery research, and in fact, from 1991, which is when I first became aware of this issue as a, uh, 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 a staff member at Genentech, where we did 50,000 men in the original TPA trial, um, it's actually gotten worse since that 1991 pivotal trial, and now 85 percent are uh, male only. If we look at those diseases where there is a sex prevalence um, in, in those same papers, this again was Melina Kibbe, who's a vascular surgeon, 44% uh, did not specify the sex that was studied. And I think this is something that fundamentally we can all agree needs to be fixed. And of those that, I, uh, that did specify the sex, 88% included only males. If we look then at cardiovascular disease, which uh, one in three women will die from uh, heart attacks, it is the number one killer of women, regardless of race and ethnicity. Uh, and it is one of those diseases where we've placed a great deal of funding uh, of our biomedical um, research funds into cardiovascular disease exactly for these stark statistics because we'd like to change the curve of the death that occurs associated with, with cardiac disease. 
But an IOM uh, workshop showed that women were less than 40% of study participants in, in, uh, in clinical research, and 19 cardiovascular randomized control studies had 27% of females. We now host, uh, uh, Marla Mendelssohn hosts an annual event that talks about uh, sex inclusion policy in cardiovascular disease. And because we'll be talking about basic science today, um, we actually have um, data from the cardiovascular journals looking on sex differences reporting. And in this uh, uh, paper in 2011, it showed that despite the fact that so many women actually experience uh, heart uh, failure, most of, the journals actually, most of the journal articles actually are unspecified as it relates to sex. Uh, and that represents a fundamental uh, problem as it relates to normal science and the way uh, we think of ourselves um, uh, in terms of the Francis Bacon uh, methods of science. So this is something that should be uh, changing over time. If we look at other diseases, the tsunami of obesity that is overtaking our health, uh, our health system, the Endocrine Society, uh, when I was president, looked at obesity from a sex perspective. Uh, obesity is slightly higher in women than it is in men, but uh, the metabolic syndrome, which has the central uh, abdominal obesity, which is the uh, more disease prevalent uh, version of obesity, uh, is, um, disp is highly disproportionate in female, adult females versus adult males, with 65% versus 46%. But if we look at our pediatric uh, population, and track metabolic syndrome in boys and girls, we see that boys are more, have more prevalence of metabolic syndrome than do girls. This represents a, a group of very, very ill children who are going to grow up to have a variety of health issues that we're only beginning to understand. And so it's critically important that we continue to think about male and female biology uh, as it relates to the presentation of these diseases, as well as the eventual therapeutics that these boys who become young men will require. I also mentioned that uh, one of the issues with uh, the, um, some of the issues that are associated with the sex inclusion policy is the cost. Well, the cost of obesity to an individual who had, an individual adult who has obesity is calculated at nearly $4,000 of additional annual medical spending per capita. Uh, that represents an enormous health care burden on our society, and one that if we could understand better how males and females present with the disease in ways both behaviorally as well as medically to modify, we would be able to improve health uh, as well as change that cost curve. Skin differences in skin, and sex differences in skin biology is something that Northwestern has focused very heavily on. Uh, and that, uh, and some of the differences that you see here will be uh, discussed later in our panel discussion. But skin thickness differs between male and female, and of course during the life course, our skins differ in thickness over time. And if you look at wound healing, it depends on whether you're talking about skin or mucosal, whether male or females, males or females have an advantage. And so understanding this is really critically important to our dermatologic care but it also uh, informs the basic biology uh, of those people studying uh, skin disease. And in fact, one of my favorite stories about this is uh, our great um, chair of dermatology at Northwestern, Amy Powler, who's been on the Women's Health Research Institute board for many years and has sat through many of these conversations, came running back into the office after one of the presentations to say, oh my word, I just realized that all of the keratinocytes that we produce are from male. Everything we do in our skin disease research center comes from male keratinocytes. It's from the uh, uh, foreskin, from male foreskin. And so all of the biology that's been studied was there. So she and Betty Kong, a, a resident in dermatology, went on to look at overall skin biology research. And there, there again, 57% of the papers do not specify the sex of the cells and uh, only 4% have both sexes represented. So this represents an immediate, easy opportunity to simply specify sex and right the wrongs of our literature, but also probably now begin to look at comparator groups to better understand mucosal uh, uh, wound healing, for example, something that would be invaluable to our dermatology colleagues. 
So over time, we've been messaging this, and again, Francis Collins apparently didn't read our emails, Jill. I don't know why, but uh, you know, this is, seems to be a new thing. But in fact, part of it was that maybe it was a little hard to really disseminate it to the public efficiently, uh, and a little bit tough to generate that political capital that was necessary to really ensure that we could get this as a frontline uh, topic, and difficult to boil down to one single sentence. But it took a Northwestern University alumni to actually be able to capture all of these things. And that alumni was not Larry Cahill, who you will hear from later today, but it in fact was Stephen Colbert. And Stephen said in a uh, wonderful satirical um, um, event, he said, gotta leave the females out. Any scientist knows it's crucial to eliminate extraneous variables like half the global population. <laughs> and I think that really struck a nerve with many people, including Stephen Colbert, and that single sentence helps to really encapsulate why this is such an important issue. It is one of the scientific method fundamentally, and it is also one of fairness. So there have been many barriers over time to sex inclusion. Uh, partly it is that science builds on itself, and so if your boss and that boss's boss published in such a way, you tend to do the same thing. In addition, the complexity of females, for example, those uh, pesky estrus cycles. I'm not sure why hormones are always preceded by pesky, but they are, in fact, uh, more often than not preceded by the word pe pesky. But of course, on the other hand, males are mostly pre preceded by simple. So I don't know if you want to be pesky or simple. So that's something that perhaps we can debate later uh, at the reception. <laughs> It's a bias that uh, includes the fact that uh, animals are more, uh, animal, male animals and cells are more accurate, again, because of the simplicity. Part of it is really the lack of knowledge about the magnitude of a sex uh, effect that you can uh, observe. And I think once people begin to study this, that's when they start running into my office and saying, oh my goodness, this drug that I uh, prescribe every day for peripheral vascular disease works completely differently in females than it does in males. And that was my friend, Melina Kibbe, who up until that point had only studied males. And she, in fact, had killed the females, as she nicely told me at a lunch. But in fact, now she has an R01 grant that is studying the sex differences, because this particular drug actually has profoundly different mechanism on males and females. Cost is, is uh, said to be a, a barrier. Lack of institutional and IRB guidance on sex inclusion. I'm really delighted that Northwestern has provided good guidance from our Vice President for Research Office and, and from Phil Hochberger from our, our core facilities, instructing our course to in fact talk about sex, the, uh, different, uh, their different models from a sex perspective. Reviewer lack of knowledge regarding sex variables in, in experimental design. And so in fact the NIH has begun to instruct uh, all of us as peer reviews to make sure that we're more enabled to be able to better uh, review um, grants as they come in. Um, there's been a little bit of buy-in issues from some stakeholders, but again, I think the tide is largely changing on that. Uh, and this is both first started with the funders and of course with the public. Anytime we talk about this in the public sphere, it's very clear that uh, the public wants to make sure that our drug pipeline is as smooth as possible that every biomedical dollar is going as far as it can, not just toward a paper, but towards better knowledge about all of us. Uh, there's the worry about the word sex itself, and that may be something that allows us to kind of get out of the issue a little bit, but I would urge all of us to embrace the word and be able to define it in a way that allows it to be, uh, to be um, really utilized in the way that it should be. And then, of course, our publishers have neglected sex consideration, and so that's why uh, we've al allowed ourselves to actually publish without annotating the sex of the animal. We have to say dose. Can you imagine not saying the dose of a drug or the time that drug was uh, given or the temperature? You can't imagine that because we do that. But we somehow don't say whether or not the animals were males or females. At some level, that's because people presume it's male. And so I think that's one of the things that publishers are now working with us on, the Journal of Neuroscience, all the Endocrine Society journals, and I think at last count nearly 120 journals, uh, as listed by Landa Schoenbrunner at uh, Stanford, now have explicit requirements for sex as part of not only the methods, but in some cases as a part of the title, as in the case of the Endocrine Society journals.
So again, we, all of that, I, I gave you a lot of sentences, but if you wanted to boil it down to one sentence, we have to turn back to Stephen Colbert. This long-standing tradition of testing on only male subjects is based on this underlying assumption that females are simply a variation on the theme. Folks, that's science. Male is default human. So the messaging is this, um, that there's an intellectual reason that we should study the biology of sex because it informs health and therefore matters to all stages of biomedical research. There's an economic reason, the inclusion of sex in basic research provides really a cost-effective way to increase quality and reduce the long-term costs of healthcare. And really, in a personal way, there must be something more than having my baby and then waiting for my cancer, which is what the message to women in the absence of other uh, data on our own health really sounds like. And so that's why this policy really needed to be made, and we think it was really tremendous of uh, Francis Collins, Janine Clayton, and others. Uh, to announce this notice uh, uh, on um, sex inclusion. So sex is a biological variable. The policy states that NIH expects that sex is a biological variable will be factored into research designs, analyses, and reporting in vertebrate animal and human studies. Strong justification for the scientific literature, preliminary data, or other relevant considerations must be provided for applications proposing to study only one sex. So it's not an edict. It is a way for us to adhere to our ordinary scientific principles that date back to 1620. Considering sex as a biological variable, so considering is not the same thing as requiring. Uh, there was a notion that this was uh, an absolutism, but it's not. It's that we have to consider, and we have to document, and we have to be thoughtful, and we have to respond. So to our scientific community, we have to take one more step and I don't think there's anything wrong with taking one more step in determining whether or not there should be uh, sex as a variable that would be valuable in the research. Uh, it doesn't expect all of us to become experts in the field of sex differences. That's not the rationale, as I just read. But it does have all the suggestions of really looking to the literature to discuss the influence of sex, to use male and female when appropriate, to think about powering the study if you're going to in that way. And in fact, um, we have had long discussions on powering studies, something that many times basic scientists just forget to do. Uh, and then to really report it. Um, that's one of the clear mandates uh, as part of this discussion. The policy does not explicitly mention the use of cell lines or tissues. But the NIH does encourage investigators to uh, disclose the sex of those primary cells and uh, in established lines, although the latter is much more difficult. There is online a reviewer guidance in order to enable people to be able to think of this as a variable. Um, it is just an ordinary variable like time, temperature, and dose, uh, but it is something that we've all been given uh, uh, instructions on how to uh, best review sex as a biological variable. There have been some misconceptions uh, surrounding this and, and sex-based research, and so part of it really does come from maybe a little bit of ambiguity in the policy. Uh, what does it mean to consider? Does consider mean to require? Um, and so I think uh, Janine Clayton's been very clear in all of her interviews to say it is consider as was written. Uh, there's been an unfamiliarity with sex-based research practices because many people haven't done it. So we want to provide as much context and help for people who really want to do this in an authentic way. And, and there's some inherent beliefs about whether or not this is even valuable to start with. And so the, one of the uh, other myths is that female animals are too variable. Um, but um, you know, I think that there is good reason to suspect, even in neuroscience, that there's not significant variability between males and females regardless of estrous cycle stage. So it really does depend on the research field. And so you may not have to track the estrous cycle uh, as part of your work. And so this is something that each field needs to deliberate on as they uh, look towards improvement of the science that is coming out of their, uh, of their particular uh, area. Sex-based research is an unfair burden on preclinical investigators. 1993 was when clinical investigators had to include sex. There was not this kind of huge outrage that there is uh, today, or was, I guess, a, a year ago. Um, but it's, it is something that we have to continue to consider. Uh, it, it does require people to think a little bit more. It requires, perhaps, uh, buying a different sex of animals. Um, and it requires us all to think about how to do good science. And it also says that we can no longer, uh, exp uh, we can no longer um, 
ignore this influence. So um, there's another thought that it might uh, propagate gender stereotypes. Is this something that actually is going to hurt males because we're talking about them as simple? Is it going to hurt females because we're talking about things as pesky? Um, but in fact, we think that sex really is a part of who we are and our experience of health, the um, entrance into disease and the return uh, based on therapeutic interventions. And if that is true, then it is also true that we must study sex as a biological variable. And it will not then propagate a, uh, a stereotype. It will propagate better health. So there are resources for investigators from the NIH Office of Women's Health. There's an online course about how to do um, sex inclusive science. Uh, this is uh, also, there's a link from the Women's Health Research uh, Institute site. There's a guide on reporting scientific research. There is also funding for extending your research to include uh, a different sex. Uh, the NIH program officers are very willing to talk with you about this policy. And of course, here at Northwestern, we uh, have the new sex inclusion at Northwestern portion of our site that provides a variety of tools for all of you uh, to uh, be able to do better sex-based research. Um, there is, um, the website is there, sexinclusion.northwestern.edu. Uh, there's a statistical tool there. Uh, I think it's here. So there are videos on sex-inclusive medicine by a variety of leading experts. There are articles and research summaries in different topic areas like cardiovascular disease, the microbiome, pharmacology, and autoimmunity. We have a series of blogs that talk about sex-inclusive publications and highlight the methods section so you can really think about how to do this in your own field. We have monthly uh, women's health forums that are on this topic that uh, you and the uh, Chicago area are welcome to come to. We have methods for animals, cells, and humans, uh, how to cycle animals and how to breed animals. I'm doing a, uh, a, um, a lecture on cycling female animals the first week of February. Uh, that's on our website, and you're all welcome to attend. Our shared and uh, core facilities through the vice president's office have sex inclusion as part of each of the core renewals. Um, we have a, a, a document called Statistical Considerations for Sex-Based Research that you can download so you can understand how to do sex-based research uh, and the kind of statistics that would be necessary to study uh, this variable. We have the Illinois uh, Men's and Women's Health Registry, uh, and that's shown here, um, and uh, both men and women are participating in this study to allow us to include them in clinical trials. So um, the, uh, let's see, sex and so as we look forward, we want to make sure that sex is not just a statement of policy, but really becomes a scientific imperative. I hope I've made, laid out some of the arguments for how all of you in the room might be able to do that. And in the end, I think, again, we're going to improve health for both men and women. We can't really get to uh, precision or personalized medicine until we start by cutting the population in half. And so I think this is ultimately going to inform everything we do going forward. It's a new opportunity to explore an uncharted dimension of scientific space. And for all the young investigators in the room, what a wonderful opportunity. If I told you that we had the Louisiana territory was just purchased and you could now go west, how many would go west? I would. Yeah, you would too, Max. We'd be on that first Conestoga going west, wouldn't we? So I think that's what this represents to this generation of scientists, an uh, entirely new part of, sci of the scientific landscape that allows you uh, a huge amount of discovery uh, that is yours for the taking. So I started out our discussion with a hypothesis. I said that the next generation of biomedical advances that improve the lives of all people will require fundamental discovery research that includes sex as a variable. I hope I gave you a little bit of a prism through which you can all feather out the details of the sex inclusion policy and perhaps implement it in your work. So I think in truth at the one year anniversary I can confidently say that we are on our way and that's a very exciting place to be.